You know, Mike, I think me and you have been real saints spreading this wealth of knowledge to all of YouTube and anyone who watches our videos. But you guys can also be saints just by watching our videos, giving us a like, comment. But we're that's way too early. We just get into this video. We got a team recap. We talk about the Saints. How are you doing? I was gonna say, like, are you closing the video? Like, that's how we close our videos usually. And you're doing it what ten seconds in? So I mean, before people click off and think the video is done, let's get right into the draft class. Mike, what do you what do you think about New Orleans draft? The quantity is amazing. But no, in all honesty, this is a quality over quantity, and they have that. Those first two picks, you can't complain. Obviously. So, talent-wise, you can't complain. The value there, obviously, maybe taking a guard, an offensive guard or an interior offensive lineman that early, a problem. But they got the best one off the board, and it, it, it was – the gap between Ruiz and probably the next was, was pretty major. So, player value, I think good there. And I think, obviously, getting Zach Bond in the third round, that's an absolute steal. He was, he was kind of in that late first, early second. And then I, I don't know if it was the dilute – task that came out during the combine or, or what happened but for some reason he fell and the point that the Saints sweep that up adding that kind of versatility to that linebacking core phenomenal and it, in all honesty it, it for me talk about a lot swap them and it looks good keep them that way still looks good I uh I'm gonna disagree with the swap them I, I wasn't that high on Zach Bond personally I thought that when I watched him he was a little bit too finesse to me. Like, if you could get your hands on Zach Bond, you'd kind of neutralize him. The thing is, I didn't think he was third round bad. You know what I mean? I thought that this man would have been kind of early second round at the latest. I was, I, I was kind of down on the fact when people were saying that he should have been like a top 20, top 25 player. But to get him at 74, man, that is nuts. And then even Cesar Ruiz at 24, if you thought that that was your biggest hole, I don't, I don't necessarily agree considering you had a guy like Larry Warford there, but it is, it is definitely a solid spot to go and kind of lock down a position for the next four or five years, if not longer than that. You know, and I think that Ruiz, he was a really interesting prospect to me, really kind of strong hands. It was actually kind of surprisingly mobile in terms of like getting up to the second level. The only thing I had kind of knocking him was I thought that he was, he was a little bit overly aggressive sometimes and would get tunnel vision. But it's like when you're going to, when you're going into an offensive line next to Ryan Ramchick, Eric McCoy, all these fantastic players, Teron Armstead, Andres Pete, so like you can have tunnel vision and you could be overly aggressive, and you're not gonna you're not gonna have to pay a, a real penalty for it, you know. So just to me, that's a really solid place for Ruiz to wind up, and it's really a place where they're gonna get the most out of him. And then in terms of like Adam Troutman, I was kind of surprised that he was, I want to say, the fourth tight end off the board. I didn't really watch much of him personally considering Dayton film isn't the easiest to come by but everybody during the combine and whatnot was really talking him up he's kind of a physical freak he's going to be an interesting player that I don't know if he'll contribute this year but really next year when Jerry Cook's a free agent I'm not sure if they'll bring him back I think that he could kind of really use a redshirt year and maybe come out of the scene next year if that makes sense but other than that I, I mean there are only four guys so I don't really have much else to say Mike are you ready to hop in this offense Actually not. I have a question for you. Okay. So I think we both agree Cesar Ruiz, good player, but we probably would have went somewhere else with that pick. Where would you have went with that first-round pick? Okay, so with that first-round pick, I would have – I know they kind of did this with the Zach Bond selection, but I was talking about their free agents next year. You have Demario Davis, Alex Anzalone, and Kiko Alonso all, all as unrestricted free agents next, next season. So I personally think that I would have went Patrick Queen. I don't, I don't think that there was really any reason that he was available at 24. And I think that that would have been a really solid guy who can make use of the Cam Jordans, Sheldon Rankins, all those guys in front of him, Marcus Davenport. I think that would have been a really interesting selection for maybe not as much the short term as in this year, but especially for these next couple of years when linebacker does become the biggest hole on the team. Where I'll pass that back to you. Where would you have went? Yeah, see, for me, this might be one of the most complete teams in the division, if not the league. So, for me, I would have went balls to the wall. I would have went absolute – I would have went wide receiver. Obviously, they have Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders. Adding that third weapon, at that point, I don't, I don't know how you could stop this team. I think if you could have added some kind of an elite weapon at that point, whether it be a Pittman, uh, uh, Higgins, or something on that, 
or Chenault would have been really interesting here. Probably too early for him, but traded back and got like a wide receiver like Chenault. I think that could have added just a different complexity to this offense that really would throw freaking defenses for a loop. No, that's really interesting because, you know, prior to coming on, I was looking back at after, you know, I, I was kind of researching the Emmanuel Sanders signing. And I, because I couldn't really remember when the Saints had a capable wide receiver two, let alone a wide receiver three, as you're saying. And really the only two years in the last decade that they have is when it was Michael Thomas's rookie year when they still had Brandon Cooks until they traded him away. And then Brandon Cooks rookie year when they had Marcus Colston and they got rid of him. So I think that right now you're kind of in an interesting circumstance where you have two guys, but I do agree that adding that third, adding a third weapon who could kind of be like a Swiss army knife, maybe would have been really interesting. And then you could have potentially picked up some more late round picks. I, I would say add to the depth of this roster, but as, as we'll see, as we'll see coming up, you really don't need it. So I, I don't hate the Ruiz selection, but I do agree that there, there's definitely some interesting luxury points that you could have went. So with that being said, are you ready to hop into the offense now? Let's get it. Let's get it. So Mike, oh man, this is a beautiful site. I, I would say, you know, find me a hole, but I don't really think there are any. So Mike, what, what are your just general thoughts on this offense? That is my thought. I'm speechless. Like it, it, it's, you, you really can't find a hole. It's talent from top to bottom. It, it's absolutely fantastic. It's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, it's, but it's also, other than adding Emmanuel Sanders, it really hasn't changed too much from last year. Obviously, they lost Larry Warford, plug in Ruiz, but they really haven't changed last year. But it wasn't a problem last year. So is it really that big a deal? No, not at all. Um, and obviously, adding Emmanuel Sanders, I think that's a huge benefit. Just one player, the amount of difference it might be able to make, I think it might be huge. It might be the one piece this team needed to, to finally cross that hump. Um, or should I say the Vikings? Um, but not the point. Um, yeah, the only thing is, is can Drew Brees still perform? I think so. I, I He has enough talent around him to do so. Uh, but that's the only qu- question I guess I'd have is can Drew Brees still ki- kick it? No, I completely agree. And if Drew Brees has anything left in him, he, he kind of is in the best scenario of anyone in the entire league, Mike. You look at this offensive line, they allowed 22 sacks last season. Let, let that sink in for a second. The fewest in the NFL, it's just over one per game. That is absolutely insane. And all you did was get younger. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of ridiculous. And then in terms of the weapons, obviously, like I said, Drew Brees hasn't – the last time he had a number two receiver, he threw for 5,200 yards on 70% completions when he had Brandon Cooks and Michael Thomas for that one year. You, I mean, you look at this offense, and you, you still have Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray too. So it's like they don't even need Drew Brees to throw for 5,000 yards, but I think that he can – if they need him to, given Michael Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. I think that my, my one kind of knock on Emmanuel these past couple of years is that, especially in Denver and even in San Francisco, is that he's not really a number one receiver anymore. You know, I think that he'd be better suited as a number two, and it doesn't get much more number two than playing behind a guy who's going to get 150 catches in a year, you know. So I think this is kind of the perfect scenario for him. You still have guys like Jared Cook. Like, I just don't – I don't even know what to say about this offense. I mean, we were talking about we were talking about Dallas's and Kansas City's as what what we thought were kind of the top two. Do you think that this like how do you compare this offense to those? I guess talent wise, I think it might be the best. I, I don't think there's really too much question. I my thing about it is Drew Brees might be the third best quarterback out of that group, but I know at this age, obviously, with at this age. I, that's my only question, but I think Drew Brees has like, but third best quarterback out of those three quarterbacks, not a problem. Um, I think that might be the only question. And obviously we, we probably debate in between the Dak and Drew and you probably disagree there. Uh, I think, I think it's in consideration. I'm not even saying I believe it. I'm just saying it's in consideration. He might be the third best quarterback out of that. So no, Mike, I, I completely disagree with you. I think that Drew Brees is clearly the second best quarterback of those three teams. And if you agree with Mike, click on click on Dak Prescott or Drew Brees in the poll right of, right above my head because I think that that's kind of a blasphemous thing to say. Drew Brees could be 47 years old, and I think that he's still he's still kind of a better quarterback than Dak Prescott. I'm not going to lie, but a part of that is the situation that he's in, obviously. And and as we said, this is if not if not the number one situation, it's it's a top three one for sure. So 
What we've kind of seen with those other two teams, though, is that on the offensive side of the ball, there's staff, and then maybe there's some more question marks on the defensive side. But can you even say that about the Saints, Mike? That, that's my first question to you. Like, where, where are the holes on this side either? This defense is nasty. This defense, obviously you have the amount of slash X player. It's crazy. They basically have two defenses. They have enough to replace basically every position on there. If they face any injuries on this side of the ball, they are well-equipped. They are the most well-equipped team. The depth on this side is absolutely astronomical. Um, but, obviously, we like to talk about front fours. I'm going to talk about front fours. Oh, man, it's a beautiful thing. Cam Jordan is a player. He's probably one of my – he's not underestimated at this point. I think for a couple of years he probably was. But at this point, I think people know what Cam Jordan is. He's an animal. He Sometimes, man, he looks like a linebacker on the field. He really is just around the ball. You see him everywhere. You see him making plays in the run. You see him making plays in the pass. You see him lined up on the inside, rushing from the interior. Love the player. And, and obviously, I think maybe the biggest hole on this, in Malcolm Brown, I think is a good player. But when it's kind of like on the offensive, kind of just like the offensive line. Like when you put him next to Sheldon Rankins, Cam Jordan, Marcus Davenport obviously hopefully makes that next turn. But uh, Mario Edwards. And then Trey Hendrickson, who played great when he was in. You've seen him flying around the ball. Like, I don't think it's really that big of a problem. Like, I think he's going to be able to perform absolutely great next to this defense. And then it just – it doesn't stop there. Usually we – when we see front fours like that, we kind of see a problem maybe on the back end. Not this team. Not this team. To have Janoris Jenkins as your number two corner, that's better than a lot of teams' number one corner. And, and that just shows to the depth of this team. And then uh, I'll just stop right here. I'm kind of taking all your thunder, and I apologize, Mike, but just excited. This safety duo, getting that Malcolm Jenkins in free agency, that's a fun little player. Adding that vet to the back of this defense, man, it's, I just feel like it's just a solid, solid signing. And then pair him with Marcus Williams, obviously just a ball hawk. Uh, may, maybe missed a couple plays, Vikings game. Um, but other than that, just absolute solid duo right there. And, and you can't find a hole. No, you really, you really can't. I mean, I think line, if I had to pick one out, it would probably be linebacker a little bit with Anzalone and Kiko. But it's like having Shaquille and Zach Bond behind them, you really can't. You can't complain. I mean, the only, one thing I did want to mention about Malcolm Jenkins, you, you said getting Malcolm Jenkins. They're getting back Malcolm Jenkins, you know. They, they used to have him. He ends up going to the Eagles. I think that he kind of hits his stride. It's his peak, and now you're getting him back. Like, I don't know I don't know how you can complain about that. I think he's a perfect fit for this defense. I mean, other than that, you kind of you said it all, man. Janoris Jenkins is a great number two. That front four, that's fantastic. One question I did, I was kind of thinking of while you were talking about Cam Jordan. Do you think that this team has, like, three or four kind of Hall of Famers at this point? Like, in Breeze, probably Michael Thomas, Cam Jordan, and maybe even, like, a Marshawn Lattimore? Like, I think that this is the first team so far we can really say that they have two absolutely kind of generational guys on each side of the ball. You know, are you, are you kind of in the same vein there or not quite? No, I, I, I'd agree. I think there's three. I think obviously Cam Jordan might be the one on the edge, but if you just put film on, maybe he doesn't get the sacks he has of recently, but maybe he doesn't always show that kind of production that shows up on a stat sheet, but just watch the games. You just got to watch some Saints games, and you will see Cam Jordan flying around the field. You'll see him making plays. And if he's not the one making the tackle or the sack, he's the reason the sack or tackle was happening in the first place. So if you just look off talent-wise, yeah, Cam Jordan belongs there. So I'd totally agree with you. And then, like you said, if Cam Jordan's not making the plays, man, you have Sheldon Rankins, Demario Davis, all these other guys who are just, just absolute beasts. And really, there's nobody who is really kind of one-dimensional either. I mean, you said kind of Malcolm Brown, but other than that, all of those guys can both rush the passer and stop the run. That linebacking core, they all can cover, but they can all fill against the run. Like, it's just such a beautiful sight, Mike. And I, I really think that what we're going to see with this division, obviously we just did Carolina. We have Atlanta and Tampa to go. But obviously those teams are really talented on offense, and some of them have talented you know, defensive fronts. What you really see is just from front to back, this team starts to pull away, you know, when you really look at it and take the whole picture into account because those other teams do have 
massive holes. We'll talk about the Falcons and their secondary. We'll talk about some of the Buccaneers' defense. And obviously, we talked about Carolina and their secondary. This team just doesn't have it, you know? Yeah, and just before we leave this slide, I just want to – with this depth, it's almost like they're preparing for some team to put a bounty on some of their players. I don't know what kind of team would do something like that. But with this depth, I, they might be preparing for it, but they, they're well equipped for it. I suppose that, yes, Sean Payton is always well equipped for a little bounty gate. And like, with that being said, let's hop right into the schedule. Obviously, what we'll see here is – the Saints having to face the NFC North, AFC West, and their own division, it's kind of a tough schedule. I know Vegas has the odds at right around 10, the over-under at 10, excuse me. What, what kind of side of the coin do you fall on there? Yeah, and I, I think probably on – it's hard. It's really hard because, man, they're, they are well-equipped. They're well-talented, but – they ha- this is a tough schedule. I think I'd put them on the over, but man, and I think with the, their depth on this team, they're they're prepared to be in meaningful games late in the season. I think that's basically probably what they were looking for. They have enough defensive players. Yeah, someone goes down, they likely have someone that could just pop right in. It might not be as good as a starter, but man, he's still pretty damn good and better than a lot of starters in the, at that position. So I, I'd probably go with the over. I think this team is built for the long run, and I think it's built for – in a lot, in a lot of seasons and a lot of schedules, you'd be thinking, okay, this might be a, a fourteen to sixteen win team. I'm, that they have that kind of talent. No, I agree, and I mean, you look at, you just look at what they've done really the past three years. They've won thirteen games the last two and eleven before that. I think that to have the over under set at ten is kind of insulting a little bit, honestly. Like I, I realize the schedule is tough. I realize Drew Brees is getting older, but like you said, just the, the straight-up talent and then the depth behind it. Like, obviously, I feel like we've seen injuries kind of not beside the NFL the last couple of years, but it's played a huge factor. Really, nobody over these past couple of years has necessarily been able to, like, escape the injury bug, let's say, and New Orleans included. You know, obviously, we saw Drew Brees go down last year, but they were equipped to handle it. And I think this year you see that not only at quarterback, but at every single spot of the defense. You know, and, and that's why they're allowed to sign guys like a Jameis Winston or draft guys like Ruiz and draft guys like Adam Troutman and draft guys for the future and sign guys just in case they're able to have not only a plan A, but a plan B, C, and D just in case stuff goes wrong. And I really do think that this team is, is kind of set up to win now and, and really as long as they can find the air to Drew Brees set up to win long term, you know. Yeah, I'm with you. But I guess going off that, what are some games, man, you're excited to see? Oh, man, there's so many. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll say Tampa Bay week one, so I'm not going to go to that one. I'm going to say December 20th against Kansas City. I think in terms of if I had to put my money down, man, I would say that that might be a Super Bowl preview. Honestly, I think that those two teams are that good. And honestly, it's tough to say who's better. I think that Kansas City might have the edge on just explosiveness, obviously. But, man. Like Kansas City doesn't have an offensive line like New Orleans. I don't think they have the running game of Alvin Kamara either, you know. And it, it'll just be really interesting to see because I do think the the Saints defense is pretty well equipped to handle the Chiefs offense. But I don't know if the I don't know if the inverse can be said. And I don't I don't know if there's many defenses equipped to handle the Saints offense. And that and that'll be a really interesting one to me. So what about what about you? Yeah, I know you said maybe potential Super Bowl matchup. I'll give you a potential NFC championship matchup. Detroit Lions, week four. I'm just messing with you. I'm messing with you. Uh, I won't go with the Bucs. I think it's, I think it's a boring take. Uh, obviously, I'm excited for both those games. I was seeing the Brady's breeze just battling it out twice. Um, but I'll give you an interesting one, the Chargers. I think that's a team. Obviously, Young, do I think they'll win the game? No, but like Seeing some of those athletes on the defensive side of the ball go against Drew Brees, I wonder if they can cause some confusion and at least make that a game. I think that'll be a fun one to watch. And I'll go number two, San Fran. November 15th, my birthday. That's going to be a fun game to watch. Uh, obviously, on both, both teams, well-equipped for that. Uh, but I think the Saints are, are better equipped. So I, I – it's going to be hard not to have the Saints as a favorite in every one of these games. So, um, but that's obviously going to be a fun matchup, watching those running backs uh, go against this this front seven. 
and this defense as a whole. Um, I think that's going to be a fun game to watch. No, I, I completely agree. But with that being said, I mean, if you guys are having fun watching Mic'd Up, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Make sure you're supporting us here. I know, obviously, we're not, you know, we're only a couple videos deep. I think this is, what, 14, 15, 16? We don't, we don't even know. We're just filming them. We're, we're putting them out there, trying to improve your guys' football knowledge. So all I really have to say is if you guys, if you guys have a comment, if you have a question, anything, if you thought that we sucked, let us know. If you, if you want to see somebody next, like if somebody says they want to see Air, the Arizona Cardinals next, who are we doing? Oh, Dad, we're doing DeAndre Hopkins, Kyler Murray, and the Arizona Cardinals. Exactly. We'll do whoever you guys want next. As of now, we're just going to keep trucking through the NFC South, go back, hit the AFC North, and then we'll, cr we'll cross the rest of it when we get there. But other than that, Mike, I don't have much else to say. What about you? No, I think we freaking mic'd up, and now we're micing out. <laughs>